after Vivian and Butchie's father broke up, Vivian fell hard for a married man. His name was Charles. Ain't it always a nigga named Charles? It's always some slick-ass, satin struthers looking bow-legged bitch with a big nose named Charles. <laughs> chance my big break the moment of reckoning it all came much faster than I ever expected I don't remember much about getting ready or getting to the club or getting to the stage I don't even remember what I sang I do remember the feeling in the room that night there was a heaviness in the air cigarette smoke hung in the room like a blanket of fog the smell of booze was strong and stifling. But more than anything else, the place was heavy with expectation. This was not Beulah Baptist. This was not Batram High School. This wasn't even the Carmen Skating Rink. This was the Coliseum, the Lion's Den, and I was fresh raw meat. That Monday night at the Venus Lounge, I didn't sing whatever song it was that I chose. I butchered it. The transformation that always happened whenever I sang, that metamorphosis never came. If there was any magic at all in the place that night, it was seeing my golden opportunity disappear. Vanish into thin air, poof. Just like that, it was gone. So was my professional career. Over before it even began, the audience didn't exactly boo me off stage. That would have been better than what they did. Nothing. I got the silent treatment, as if I had never even been there. Now, she was able to get the gig because one of her teachers at her high school had said, hey, look, I know the owner of the Venus Lounge, and I want you to sing for them. I done hooked it up for you. All you got to do is just be you. Patty got the opportunity to be her, and she messed it up. She felt more bad about disappointing the teacher that garnered her the opportunity than she did for herself. So what she did was went over there to the teacher and said, Look, teacher, I know I messed this up, but I need you to go over there to your friend and ask him to give me another chance. The teacher was like, I don't know, Patty, I don't know. Uh, we both know you can do better, but you just may not be ready yet. She said, I'm ready. And the second go round, she tore it up. There had been a lot of changes in our family by 1961. Jackie got pregnant, and three months before her 16th birthday, she gave birth to her son, Billy. Chubby adored Billy and spoiled him rotten. In fact, it was my mother who really raised him. Jackie's pregnancy had to feel like deja vu all over again to her. Just a dozen years earlier, Chubby had gone through the same thing with Vivian. Like Jackie, Vivian got pregnant in high school and was only 16 when she had her only son, Percy, or Bushy, as everyone calls him. Of course, Chubby knew firsthand what it was like to be a teenage mother, a single teenage mother at that. By the time she was 16, she was raising not one child, but two. Every mother knows her child in her heart. I think Chubby knew Jackie wasn't ready for motherhood. Therefore, that's why the mother took on or assisted in raising the baby. I don't know if it's because my environment has changed drastically, but I don't see teenage pregnancies like that anymore. I realize that it does happen, but I know around the time that my mother and my aunts were young, I mean, it was rampant. And I believe that's because they felt that having a baby and getting married was their escape from being under their mother's roof, which didn't happen with Hilda the Great, because my 
grandmother was like, oh, fuck no. You can get married, but you still staying under my roof. And at the time, the house was big enough so that each auntie, including my mother, could have their family and their husband in a room. And my uncle stayed in the basement, huge house, Barnum Street, uptown, Northwest. It just seemed like it was a must do to have a child. And to this day, I still be looking at it like, how the hell a child gonna have a child? Now, I mean, all my aunts, they did it. They raised their children, but they also had the help of the sisters and my grandmother. When you find young girls with no support, God damn it, Brenda's got a baby. I be like, how do they do it? Chubby and Vivian were having problems too. After Vivian and Butchie's father broke up, Vivian fell hard for a married man. His name was Charles. Ain't it always a nigga named Charles? It's always some slick ass, satin struthers looking, bow legged bitch with a big nose named Charles. But Vivian called him Old Faithful because no matter how bad things would get for her and they would get insufferable, he stuck by her every agonizing step of the way. But none of us could know that when they started seeing each other, especially Chubby. At the time, all she knew was that Charles had a wife and Vivian was his chick on the side. They fought about it day and night. Chubby screaming at Vivian, can't you see you're wasting your life in a dead end relationship? Vivian screaming back at Chubby, can't you see Charles is my life? And I want this relationship. Neither would give in. I don't think either of them could. And the stalemate finally drove Vivian out of the house. After months of arguing, Vivian, the sister I idled and adored, found an apartment and she and Butchie moved out. By the time Vivian and Butchie left, Chubby had broken up with the boyfriend who had abused me. And the day he left our house for the last time, I knew God had answered my prayers. Soon the rest of us would leave Elmwood as well, but unlike Vivian, we didn't move by choice. In the late 50s, the city of Philadelphia got the bright idea to target Elmwood for a massive redevelopment. It was a big deal. The largest in the country at the time, a hundred million dollar urban renewal scheme. I don't know what our community's redevelopment meant to Philadelphia. I do know what it meant to families who lived there. It meant losing our homes, being torn from our roots. As the old timers used to say, urban renewal means Negro removal. That's why it's so important to own your property and I understand that everybody does not have the means financially or mentally to get that done but man the way they are tearing up Washington DC right now makes me want to stick foot in that goddamn 27 piece suit wearing ass bitch Merle Bowser. Fucking bitch. I don't even live in DC no more and I still be pissed off about how the city is so gentrified. I mean, it's not even just about the fact that you tear down all the projects, but it's more so you're turning the city into something grotesque. It's like you putting up buildings in every nook and cranny, every single nook and cranny, and bitch, the rats are out of fucking control. Do you hear me? Do something about them rats, bitch. Chubby didn't put up a fight for our house as much as she loved it. I think she was ready to let it go. It was filled with so much of her past, so much of my father, so much to remind her of a life and a love affair that has ceased to exist outside her memories. With the money she got from the city, oh, okay, so they made her move. Oh yeah, the city can do that because you know it's all a scam. You know, like D.C., how it is, is, oh, you own the house, but you don't own the land. We'll pay for your house. But if we want to take the land, we can. You better take this little piece of change that we're giving you, beach, Okay? Because we could still pick this house up and move it somewhere else. Okay? Because the land that your house on is ours. That's the goop. Chubby went out and found us another four-bedroom house at 5819 Washington Avenue. It was about 15 minutes outside of Elmwood, but 
On moving day, you would have thought I was leaving for Siberia. I was so depressed. Even my blues had blues. I move out of Elmwood was a perfect example of this simple truth. It turned out to be the right thing at the right time. In fact, looking back, I believe it was fate. Had we not been forced to move, I would have never met the man who became my first manager. The man who gave me my first break as a professional in the music business. With the radio pumping out songs by the Shirelles, the Chandeliers, the Chiffons, and Lord knows how many other hot new girl groups, I was desperate to be part of it all. So desperate, in fact, that I wiped out all memory of the Elm Tones and set out to form a group. I hooked up with three high school classmates, Yvonne Hodgen, Jean Brown, and Johnny Dawson. We all lived within a few blocks of one another. For the next several months, with visions of American bandstand dancing in our heads, we spent every free moment at one another's houses, tightening up our harmony and choreographing dance steps. In those days, you couldn't just stand behind a mic and sing. You had to be able to move, baby. As we worked on our routines, we would give shows in my living room. It wasn't long before we decided to take our show on the road. We started performing around town at sock hops, school dances, and neighborhood parties. We sang everywhere we could, the front steps, the back porch, the bus stop, for anyone who would listen. One afternoon, we were rehearsing at Jean's house. We weren't supposed to be there that day. We had planned to hold practice at my house, but for some unexplainable reason, we changed at the last minute. We were deep into it when Mr. Walt Overby, a friend of Jean's mom, dropped by unexpectedly. We wasn't supposed to be there either, but then again, maybe he was. He and Mrs. Brown were sitting in the living room shooting the breeze, but he kept tuning out her conversation and tuning into the music floating up from the basement. Mr. Overby was like, who's that on the radio? I never heard that before. Jean's mama was like, that's uh, Jean and her friends. Really? You sure? Yeah, they down there in the basement. You can go see. So he goes to the basement. Mr. Overby's neighbor, Bernard Montague, was a former print shop manager who had quit his job to promote variety shows and R&B reviews. He lived right around the corner on Ellsworth Street, and he had a reputation as an ace artist manager, a man with strong connections in the local club circuit who could break new acts. He's looking for a girl group, Mr. Overby told us, and with your voices, he can take you places. Well, that was all we needed to hear. Before Mr. Overby could get up the stairs good, we had Mr. Montague on the line. I'm not sure which of us did the talking, but whoever it was must have been pretty convincing because Mr. Montague agreed to audition us the very next day. He told us to sing a cappella. He wanted to hear us, just us, our voices, our harmony, our sound. Mr. Montague was so blunt we froze, but Jean's sister, Diane, who tagged along to watch, jumped up and belted out the Gladys Knight hit with every beat of my heart. I don't know if Mr. Montague knew Diane was just showing off, but he looked at her as if he thought she was auditioning. Next, he said, that meant us. Now, we weren't just nervous. We were terrified. I looked over at Chubby, and she gave me a wink and a nod. No words were necessary. I got the message. It was going to be all right. She wouldn't have brought me here if she didn't believe I could handle it. She would never set me up for a failure. Having your family support you or your maid or your children. You know, because sometimes people just want to live their dreams. And even if you look stupid, it's just a point that somebody believed in you enough to go to the place where the dream was, sit there with you, do your dream, and whether you 
exceed in your dream or not. It's just the fact that you supported me in doing it. Word. We decided to do two songs that we have been practicing forever. Two songs that showed off our moves and our close-knit harmony. I can't swear to it, but I'm pretty sure we did. I met him on a Sunday by the Shirelles, and he's gone by the Chantels. When we finished, Chubby was smiling, but there was just one problem. Mr. Montague wasn't smiling. You kids have potential, but you need a lot of work, he said. If you follow my rules, rehearse long and hard with my people, I'll put you on my show. Mr. Montague started managing us around 1961, and he didn't waste any time getting us in shape to appear in his R&B reviews. Opportunity knocked much sooner than any of us could have imagined. After only a few months of rehearsals, Mr. Montague managed to get us booked to perform at the Orchard Ballroom. This wasn't record hops and roller rinks. This was a serious gig. Back then, the Orchard Ballroom was one of the in places to go to in Philadelphia, like the Peppermint Lounge in New York. It was where all the beautiful people went to see and be seen oh shit so now it's time to figure out a name because the announcer can't say oh here go um Patsy, jean yvonne and johnny we need a name and they fell into the ordets i don't get it i don't get it but okay it was perfect for them despite our early success the original ordets would soon fall apart Taking a ride on the east side, made a left on MLK. What a beautiful day, what a beautiful day. Riding high on the west side, looking for a hood where to play. Won't you come out and play? Won't you come out and play? Hey, taking a ride. Hey, hey, on the south side. Ooh, ooh, hey, 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 h